Go for it. I'd like for you to meet Chaplain Ruth Hanusa, who's going to be speaking with you about spiritual care today. And she helps us to be respectful of the way all people express their spirituality. So I'm going to run and look for something that I'm missing. Please take it away and be kind to Ruth. She's one of my favorites. And uh, here we go. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I've been working here at St. Mary's uh, Hospice since last October, and I've done a variety of things. I was ordained in 1979, and I've done a whole host of things, campus ministry, I've taught to community college in the prison system, I've done uh, student teaching, and homebound teaching, I've done a lot of interims in churches, I've been a co-pastor, I've been an assistant pastor, um, I've taught at the university, all kinds of things. Um, but this is this is kind of a new adventure in some ways for me because I've never worked with hospice. On the other hand, um, a lot of, uh, of my experiences, both as just as a human being and as a theologian and pastor, have kind of come together in, in this experience. So what I would like to do um, with the time that we have is to, to do a couple, two, two things. One is I want to tell you what I do so that you have a sense of of how you fit into the, the whole team. I'm assuming that all the disciplines will be sharing with you what they do. And also, um, to assist you, uh, because you may be doing some spiritual carrots from time to time, and so maybe I can give you some ideas and hints on how to do that. Um, I also want to give the theological and psychological and just common sense underpinnings for, for what I do as well. Um, chaplains in, in the disciplines that are working with hospice uh, probably have the most ambiguous job description. We have case managers, nurses, we have CNAs, we have social workers, uh, we have a medical director, we have volunteer coordinator, um, uh, multiple uh, office staff. But the core team consists of the medical director, nurse, social worker, and chaplain, and the volunteer coordinator, I believe, those five. And um, the, the, the first four have the most direct patient care, but the chaplains have the most ambiguous job description. Uh, we have the heaviest caseload, um, and we have um, the greatest number of, of patients, the fewest hours to do it in. Um, and so we, how we uh, work uh, means that we have to rely heavily on teamwork, and so we rely heavily on, on volunteers. We have to, because um, at half time we have, can have like 23 patients at a time. And since on, ho on St. Mary's Hospice right now, Half of our patients uh, only stay on a week or less. So not only would you have 23 patients at a given time, in a month's time, you might have 40 to 45 because they're on and they're gone. Some we don't even see. So uh, we have to work quickly sometimes and, and also judiciously in terms of, of um, who to, you know, we triage, I guess, a lot. Um, what I do is within, um, we have seven days when, as soon as a uh, person comes on to make contact within admission. Um, and that doesn't mean that we have a full blown visit, it just means that we've connected with them. I usually wait several days because um, for a number of these people, this is uh, a, a, a different experience. Uh, for some of them, this is a brand new diagnosis. Uh, people who've never gone to the doctor before and suddenly are in stage four cancer, for instance. Or they've been struggling, struggling, struggling to fight a cancer and the doctor finally says, this isn't going anywhere. Um, so often, they're just reeling with, with the whole um, the diagnosis and the about phase that happens when you choose hospice um, everything in the Western medicine says we will fix you, we will cure you, we're going to keep trying to the very last minute. One more thing, one more, you know, my mother at 80 years old had a triple bypass surgery. You know, we just assume you can just keep doing and doing and doing. To choose hospice, both for the patient and the family, says we're going to give up on that kind of madness, and in the cases where it is madness, and we're going to just let the person die naturally 
and will keep them as comfortable as they can and give them the highest quality of life towards the end as they can. But that, that is turning your back on, on our culture and Western medicine in a sense. And um, sometimes they, the families don't get a lot of support from the culture. Uh, and even within a family, it'll be, you know, you're trying to kill mom, you know, kind of thing, because we aren't going to be coding her or rushing her off to ICU, you know, the first moment she has trouble breathing. And so, because they're adjusting to all of that, I don't call them the very first minute unless a nurse calls me and says, you need to get out there now. And that has happened. Um, I had one ca case where a man was, um, um, he, he had been sick for a couple of years, but the, the, he was terminal, and in fact had only a day or two, it was quite recent. And the nurse said, go and meet the family at the home, uh, he, and he only had about less than 20 hours at that point. But under most conditions, I, I give them a few days. And the, so I call them up, introduce myself, just kind of chat it up, you know, chat them up. If I've gotten some warning from uh, the admission nurse or someone else that they're, they really don't want a chaplain, I may say I'm one of the ho I'm part of the hospice team, and what we do is we just you know kind of hang with you. This woman I, or this a patient I just told you about, where the man um, had 72 hours uh, to live according to the doctor. I got there at about three and was there till six. The people were coming and going. All of it, he was young. His friends saying goodbye to him. And at one point, his wife uh, introduced me to somebody who just arrived, and she said, "This is the chaplain. She's just hanging out with us." So that's, that's a lot of what we do, and often when I have a case where I, I su I'm suspecting that they are unwilling to have pastoral care or spiritual care or religion or anything like that, um, I will sometimes just, you know, kind of really soft pedal it and let them know that primarily what we provide is presence, a ministry of presence. Um, and uh, but some people are you know we have a chat the first 20 first phone call you know it's 20 minutes half hour you know um, other times it's it's briefer and then I make an appointment for a visit um, the first visit on, on a lot of those are just getting acquainted they're um, so how long you been in Reno you like living here where did you grow up you know all that kind of stuff in the case of the patient a lot of that time that rolls into what we call life review um, that you you know, just hear their old stories. And especially with patients who have dementia or are beginning to fail, they sometimes have easier access to those old memories. Um, I have a woman who's 90-some and, and the other, I've seen her twice now. And her, um, one of her, her, she really loved her father. Her mother died young, she had a wicked stepmother, all kinds of things, uh, got married at 15 just to get away from this wicked stepmother, but was riding horses at age three. She grew up in Nevada ranches, and so I just walked her into those memories, and she found a little place of delight in the midst of her pain from her shingles the other day. So I do that. Also, it's really important to develop trust. Um, towards the end, I, this is a whole, the whole enterprise of hospice is a very intimate time, I think. Um, life and death are very, um, fragile, intimate times in, in the existence of human beings. And the best and the worst of family stuff pops up. Uh, you hear very, um, you hear the secrets. Sometimes they're hearing the secrets for the first time. I one time had a woman who was, um, she wouldn't sleep. She was afraid she wouldn't wake up. And uh, I also wasn't able to get in every time I called. They said, oh wait, call some back. Da, da, da. Finally Sunday morning I get a call from the nurse saying you gotta get over here now. And as I'm finishing primping in the mirror before going over there, I thought, I wonder if this woman had an abortion. And I don't know where that came from. So I get there, and we're talking, whatever. And they, one of the daughters said, did you all know mom had an abortion? And they go, huh? And she said, well, she just told me. So I don't know where it came from in my head. But it's, you know, you're present for, for sometimes deep, dark family secrets. And, and she was Catholic, sort of. Uh, deep, dark secrets that are, you know, bubbling up the first time. So it, it for in order it to be a really good, um, I think, experience for the family, uh, and you need to build build trust. And so I spend time doing that. Those early visits, just you know, just chatting up and hanging in there and, and whatever. All um, you too might might be uh, in positions because uh, volunteers frequently go far oftener than I can, can, am able to do. Medicare requires us to visit once a month. And when our case loads high, we're pushing that, getting there that often. But you guys uh, go one, two times a week. And so you would have a lot more time 
to build that kind of trust, to hear the life review stories and stuff. And you might hear, it, depending on the match, you know, there are better and worse matches. You may at some point have somebody who, who really opens up to you in the way they wouldn't with any other member of the team. So um, it's always wise to go gently and carefully and, and, um, and be aware that, that probably every encounter you have is either building trust or tearing it down one way or the other. So um, some people on these early visits, especially our long-term ones, some of them uh, like a prayer. I offer, often offer it. I just do ex corde just on the spot, ask them what they'd like, if they'd like anything included. Um, a lot of them like that. Others have declined. I have one woman who the very first time said, no, I don't want you to pray with me. I said my own prayers. I said, that's perfectly fine. Uh, and you might think that this woman is completely a-spiritual and never <coughs> that she does not. Um, my son was in Iraq the last year, and she called me one time, and she said, I just want you to know that I pray every day for Benjamin. I say, oh, dear God, please keep him safe, and I carry him in my heart every day, all day long. This is a woman who doesn't want me to pray with her, so, you know. There's just all kinds of, of spirituality. Um, some of them, um, I have some patients who want me to bring communion every week to them. I do that. Sometimes, um, especially in cases of dementia or where the patient's non-responsive, I just sit and sing hymns for about an hour. Um, uh, sometimes anointing, service of healing, uh, whatever. You just, you just never know. You, I have a whole trunk full of, of hymnals. I have Lutheran, Presbyterian, Methodist, uh, Baptist, Pilgrim, the whole schmear. So whatever they want, I go in. You know, if they're really Protestant, I go with them. The Methodist ones, if they're kind of Catholic but really Protestant, I do Episcopal or something. So any, I, you know, I, 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 you know, it, you just do the best you can. Um, and in time, as uh, with some of these longer term patients who are on for a longer period of time, um, sometimes questions will come up about you know, so what do you think the afterlife is? Or they might, might talk about how they haven't felt like they've been a very good person or those kinds of stuff. So that, in time, that stuff may come up. Um, that's kind of one category of, of patient where there's some time to do something. You know, they're on for months, even years. The other one is getting called in pretty close to the time of death. And sometimes this can be someone who I've been developing a relationship with um, but you haven't, we haven't really gotten to some nitty gritty stuff. It's one thing to agree to be on hospice because they're going to die. They have a disease process that was likely to lead to their death in six months. That's the definition. Um, and, but, but all of us can say that, yeah, well, I know I'm going to die someday. I was born and yeah, it's one way street. And we all intellectually can do that. And then there reaches a point where they go, oh my God, I'm going to die. And there's just, there's a shift that happens. Some of them never quite get there because they don't even want to acknowledge it. But they, there's a real kind of, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm on the doorstep now. And um, there's the, then some different kinds of things will happen. <coughs> um, so if I'm there when, um, at the, when death is imminent, when either they're, they're becoming non-responsive or what we call actively dying, I often am doing death coaching. Um, and I understand, I don't know that anybody else uses this term, this is mine. I, I think that in the same way that we need a birth coach to get us into this life, we probably need a death coach to help us get out. And that being born might indeed be a very frightening experience. We just all don't have any memory of that. You know, you get your little head gets mushed up and you got to start breathing on your own and your arms are flailing and you got to start growing up. My God, you know, it's awful. <laughs> it's awful rude awakening. Um, and who's, who's to say what happens uh, in the process of dying? I mean, the dead, they don't call, they don't write, they don't email, nobody gives us any report. You know, we're taking stabs at what, what this is about, you know. Um, and so in my coaching, I will, and sometimes practically have to crawl right in bed with them, uh, or at least real close, because you don't know, I assume, we always assume that the hearing's the last thing to go, that they are hearing very, and you, you can, you, there's all kinds of evidence of that. Um, you know, they wake up, they respond, they open their eyes, they wiggle their eyebrows, I mean, at, at certain kinds of things, you know. But um, I get in real close and I tell them three things. Number one, that they are um, loved absolutely and unconditionally by God and by their family members. I don't always know if that's true of their family members, but I say it and I just hope it's the case. I know it's true of God. That everything's been forgiven and that they won't be left alone or abandoned. Those are the three things I want them to know. I want the family members to know that too. 
And I actually don't just say it in coaching, I say it in a multitude of ways, both verbally and non-verbally. Um, I say it of course, often it's in most of the prayers that I do, um, the liturgies that we use, both the, the service for anointing and healing. Healing in that sense is not a cure, um, but it's, it's about wholeness of spirit and, and well-being. Um, it's in the, the last rite, nobody does last rites anymore, not even Catholics, but you know, people still have this kind of sense of, of what it is, kind of a, it, it, one, the Lutherans call it commendation um, of the dying, the uh, Episcopalians call it ministration at the time of death, I think Catholics are calling it sacrament of the sick, I mean it's got various, various names, but anyway, I, those three things are said in, in those liturgies as well, and um, so I want them to know that, but I do the actual coaching. I just get real close and, you know, just talk them through it and, and tell them, um, you know, uh, you go girl, or, um, you know, keep on, just relax, keep breathing, you won't be dropped, um, you're going to be carried right on in, it's kind of like you're a baton and we're, we on this side are passing you to the folks on the other side. Just, just kind of encouragement, what you might do with a marathon runner, you know, just, just encourage them and cheer them on. Uh, also, sometimes I then, in fact, do do last rites uh, with anointing. Um, and, and also at a time like that, especially when it's protracted, I might particularly sing hymns or read scripture or something like that. I had one man who, um, I, I'd never met him, I got there and he was very agitated. He said, oh, I'm dying, I'm dying, I don't know what to do. And nothing would calm him down, including his medication, the lorazepam. Um, but his daughter-in-law said he loves the Nicene Creed. This is an old time Presbyterian. He'd written the, the history of the Presbytery and it was just steeped in his tradition. So I recited the Nicene Creed. We did the Apostles' Creed. I did the Lord's Prayer. And she says, You know, why don't you just read to him out of the Bible? So I read Genesis 1 and 2. It was Christmas. So I read Luke 1 and 2. I read Romans 8. I read Psalm 23. I read uh, 1 Corinthians 13. I mean, I, a lot of standard ones that I knew that he would just speak to his soul. And then um, the nurse came and was doing stuff with him, so I was in the living room and I made a full page list of kind of standard comforting text for his family to read to him, because I obviously wasn't going to be keeping the death watch. They had a full page of, of kind of things that I could bet on would be comforting to him. The funny thing is that when I started reading to him, he calmed right down, because it spoke to his soul. And so um, I tried to, if I can't find out if what what was the tradition way back there? What what did they grow up as a child? I mean, if they ended up Catholic, were they Baptist to begin with? And then we need to do something different than you know, or or, or where in between, you know. Um, so um, one of the ways that I um, I want to go back again to the loved uh, unconditionally, the forgiven, and the, and the not being alone. Um, one of the, the nonverbal ways that I think we communicate um, that they are loved unconditionally is that we waste time with them. And wasting uh, time is something that is clearly anathema in our culture. I mean, you know, there's all kinds of books on how to be efficient and not do this and do multitask, and we're terribly concerned about all of that. And for those of us whose, my mother grew up in the Depression, I still haven't gotten over it. And, you know, <laughs> wasting of any kind is something that you just don't do, you know. Um, when, I, when my kids were little, we went to a PTA workshop or something and, and heard a speaker who was terrible, except he said one good thing. He said that if you have a child who's acting out, um, if one parent spends 15 minutes a week with that child, just wasting time with them, not, you know, just, you can't say, I'm going to the store for milk, you want to come along. That doesn't count because it's something productive and efficient. But you just take that kid to get them an ice cream or something and you sit and talk with them, not about their homework or how messy their room is or how bad their behavior, but just listen to the kid and talk about what they're interested in, their hopes, dreams, whatever. 15 minutes a week improves behavior. Now that's kind of counterproductive because I just said that it's productive of something. but. Uh, without focusing on trying to be productive, just wasting time with another person, what it does is it says to that person, irrespective of how you're performing in any other area of your life, you are a valuable person and you are loved. That's what it says. It's the same thing that you do when you've got a friend and you go to lunch and you order a bottle of wine and you're there till four o'clock in the afternoon. 
or an evening where you sit and drink three bottles of wine and tell your long stories, you know? It is that wasting time with another where you aren't planning anything, you aren't setting your five-year, you know, goals or anything like that, but you are just wasting time and saying to that other person that you're valuable just for you, who you are. And that's what we do on hospice. These folks are dying. They aren't producing anything. You know what? They're getting, they're becoming more and more dependent. They can't do anything for themselves increasingly. And, um, and to all accounts, in this busy, productive world that we live in, they are useless and worthless. And so uh, by wasting time with them, because all of your time is valuable, my time is valuable, we say to them how very valuable they are. In conjunction with that, I often will let them, if it's appropriate, let them in on parts of my life so that they can kind of um, still be who they used to be. I have one woman who was a nurse and a very uh, efficient, proficient, uh, very in charge of her life and all kinds of other people's. And um, she loves to just help me with my problems. And so I was saying that I needed a, a, a medical law. She said, well, what you do, you, you ask the nurses you work with. And, da, 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 da. and I was saying I didn't like my ophthalmologist. Well, she says, I know who you need to go to. You need to go to Gary Palmer, blah, 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 blah. You know, I'm, I'm sort of hamming this up, but it's, it's much more natural than that. And what that does is that, that she's sitting there with COPD, it sometimes can hardly get her breath, can't always go out. The other day her dog jumped off her lap and just his nail just nicked her leg and blood was spurting everywhere. She's on prednisone and she can't get out much. And that's really hard for her that she cannot get out and go. And so I bring a bit of her old world into her for a couple of hours every couple of weeks and that just lifts her incredibly, you know. So some of, and that has to be done judiciously. It's always about the patient and only secondarily about you. But to the extent that you're able to, to restore to them a bit of their former glory, that's a gift. They're still human beings, and to the, to the last breath they take, they still have value, and, and the work that they've done in this world has been valuable, and, and that continues. And if you, can, if you can give them a bit of that, that's, that's really good, I think. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about being forgiven because I think that that's one of the, the most difficult things that, that we confront. Often I will get a guy, I had one guy who was so uh, agitated, um, he, um, he, he'd been roaming around for about two nights, the family wasn't getting any sleep, they weren't probably medicating enough either, but anyway, he, was, he would sit up, he'd sit on the edge of the chair and I probably gasp, he was falling off. He'd try to walk around and sit where there weren't chairs. He was taking his clothes off. So we said, okay, give him some lorazepam, first of all. And then secondly, I did that death coaching. Uh, he wasn't completely non-responsive. He was roaming around. But I got right next to him in his easy chair, and I did my, you're loved unconditionally, everything's forgiven. His eyes are closed, and when I said, everything's forgiven, he went like this. And I thought, okay, there we go. So I went and got my book and did the service of, I think it was sort of Episcopalian somewhere, maybe Catholic, I don't know. Anyway, I, w I went to kind of the Catholic end of the spectrum uh, and did uh, the anointing. And um, he calmed down, slept, slept through the whole night. They finally got some rest. Now, it's probably a combination of the two things, but I think some of his agitation was due that he wasn't sure if he's forgiven. And 86% and of Nevadans are unchurched. Um, if you ask them, they probably say they're, you know, they're Christian, but that's the default religion in this country predominantly. I mean, it's, it's like being, Amer I'm American, and so therefore I'm Christian. I'm not one of those Muslims, you know? I mean, that's kind of that's the attitude. But just having been kind of a generic default Christian doesn't mean that they've been nurtured in the faith. I mean, Christian congregation, or any congregation has all kinds of problems. Communities are messy. There's no doubt about it. And, you know, I sometimes can't stand it, and I'm a pastor. But anyway, um, you, you do get nurtured. You know, there are people who are, when you're sick and dying, who bring casseroles and call you up and send you cards and stuff. And a lot of people in our culture are cut off from communities. And I think that's probably increasingly happening as more internet connections and communities are happening, where you can create your own persona and personality, and people don't really get to know how yucky you are, like you do in a real congregation. You really see how, how nasty folks can be. Um, 
and and so but what is lingering there is that um, they haven't heard the words that you're forgiven very often and they're they're in a world of hurt some of them so um, and and one of uh, I want to share with you my demonstration of forgiveness because it's possible that someone might um, you know open up to you in a way they won't to me we had a woman who just died recently she was a very private person from the beginning she was Greek Orthodox from the beginning I said here's the information for Father Bradiosis you can call him whenever you want he's a wonderful gracious man no 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 I gave it to the daughter she had it I called later I saw Father George at Silver Peak he's he, I've told him about you you can call anytime no mom's not ready you know well I think Tuesday Thursday and Friday of last week mom says she's ready to see him still no phone call is made she's actively dying uh, Saturday I'm going to lunch with a friend and I get a phone call um, about 1.30, I guess. Patient's getting close. Where's the phone number? I said, I think you have. Oh, yeah, we do. Well, 90 minutes, they call me again and said, well, we haven't gotten a phone call back from his office. I said, well, it is Saturday. And do you have a back line? I said, no, but I, look up in the, I looked up in the white pages while I had him on the phone. I said, well, here's his home phone number. I'll call it. And I made the connection and all of that. Um, the, the woman had died by that point. <laughs> yes, so, so, we think mom's dead, but what's his number anyway? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and and um, so it, I and I called and talked to his wife, who said, "Well, he's over at our daughter's turning on her pilot light. I'll call him." And, you know, I mean, it was a Saturday, you know. So anyway, um, the point of that story is that I, then I called the daughter this morning, and they were doing well, and he hoped to do the service tomorrow, and they went to church and had met him and all kinds of stuff. So anything, it's fine, but. Um, I don't know, I suspect that this patient who was dying was worried that he was going to walk in and just read her the riot act because she hadn't been in church the next number of years. And now he's very gracious and I know he wouldn't have done that, but I suspect that that was her worry and so they wait too long. And so there's all this kind of, you know, my God, what a, you know, I don't want to see the preacher kind of thing that's built up for them. But my understanding of forgiveness um, is that, um, and, and it comes from, the word uh, in the Greek, when the Lord's Prayer, um, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, is the word to forgive, a fiume. It means let go. And when you haven't forgiven someone because they, uh, this applies to yourself too, because they've done you dirty, it's kind of like you're standing, you know, toe to toe with them with your hands around their neck squeezing gently and hopefully your arms are longer than theirs so they can't take a swing at you but if they've hurt you you want to protect yourself and you don't want them to hurt you again so you want them at arm's length and you also want them to suffer a bit because they've hurt you so you just squeeze you know around their neck every so often you don't want to pass out you want them to stay awake and alert and in pain so you just you know do this and here you are and you're staying safe and this is supposedly a wonderful relationship um, and then you read in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And then you begin to think it's conditional. Oh my God, if I can't forgive this person, God's not forgiving me and I'm on my deathbed and I'm in some deep doo-doo. Well, I don't think that's the way it is. I think God is always showering, pouring down forgiveness from behind, above, all the way through us. But if you're still standing like this, you ain't free. I mean, forgiveness is about being free of your past. And if you're still doing this as somebody else, you can't fully experience what God has already given you. And so it's not about God's gift of forgiveness being conditional. It's that we don't maximize it because we don't take the risk of dropping our arms and letting go. Um, and, and what it means to let go um, means that you are taking a risk. The other person come back at you. I don't think it's about stupidity. It's not about uh, if you're being abused, you need to get out of there. If it, the, child molester you don't put in charge of the nursery and uh, whatever like that you maybe need to leave in order to do the letting go uh, to get clearly out of that person's space but it is uh, to, to let go of that uh, it also <coughs> lets go of, of the understanding that um, that your sense of identity is somehow related to being victim because you've been hurt by this person you maybe have no sense of self-worth because this person has done you such a dirty deed you don't have any power you can't, you don't have power to move, first of all. Uh, but to let go of that is then to say that your forgiveness, I mean, your, your sense of self-worth and your sense of self-esteem and your identity is dependent upon the fact that God loves you and has forgiven you and cares for you and, in fact, does empower you. 
and your and your trust and your basis comes in in the power and the love of God for you, and not in your ability to keep this other person at bay. And um, it is so easy in a certain sense. I mean, it can be very scary, and it's the kind of thing that I don't think happens in one step, especially if the if the the um, the um, break has been significant. I mean, very deep. I don't think it, 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 this also is not about forgive and forget. It's also about not saying, oh, well, you didn't really hurt me, when in fact you really were hurt. Um, it's about working through it. You can't go back to the beginning and start all over. You have to work through the hurt. And the, the relationship is transformed and changed. But it, on some level, you hope to have a future with that person. It also is not dependent upon the other person being repentant. Because it's about your forgiveness. Your sense of, of being free, free from that harm. Even if they aren't repentant, you don't need to be enslaved by that. So that's that's all my understanding of what forgiveness is. And um, you know, when somebody's on their deathbed, you don't have. I I never given them that spiel. If this is just the, I told you I'd give you the theological underpinnings of what I do too. Um, and and that that informs how I'm able to do that. Uh, to let them know that everything's already been forgiven, and they can let go of it, and God's let go of it. Um, so anyway, um, now the other one, other thing about um, uh, not being alone. Um, again, I say it in prayers and when I'm coaching, and and that we're just there. One of the and one of the reasons that I am so big on the this volunteer program is that um, I had a patient who the very first time I saw him I think the paperwork said he was an atheist so I went, when I went to visit him I didn't make an appointment I just showed up and I told him I was on the hospice team well he figured I was a nurse he didn't know he'd never and um, but he had horrible pain like eight out of ten at that point and um, and anyway, long story short, I helped him figure out his medications. He couldn't read the labels on the bottles, you know, and so I made him big signs. You know, with all kinds of things. Well, anyway, he loved me. I was just his favorite person in the world after this. And one time I was visiting him at a nursing home. He got transferred because he was declining. And he said, um, I was holding his hand and, and he was in the wheelchair. He said, you know, I'm, I'm so afraid of dying. He said, I know I'm a coward, but I'm just so afraid. All I want is for somebody to hold my hand. And I said, well, I can't promise that we'll be there, but we will not abandon you in, in a larger sense. And so I, I always listen very carefully to the report line. The nurses will tell us when someone is declining or, or actively dying, and so we can, if we need to get in there quickly uh, to do that. Well, um, this man was um, going into early active or active on Easter Day when we are not permitted to work or chart, and I had a house full of company anyway, so I wasn't even listening to the report line. I was listening to, I think, either late Saturday night or maybe Sunday morning, Monday morning, um, making a note, go visit him. And by the time I got to the end of the reports, he died. And I was just crushed. I thought, oh my god, I didn't get through. The poor man was alone. Blah, blah, blah. Turns out his volunteer had been there. She had had gone in just to kind of make a routine call. She didn't even know he was actively dying. She walks in. She uh, figures out what's doing. She's never had this before, so she's kind of panicky. She runs to the nurses' station. They coach her and tell her what to do, and she was there. So he was in fact not alone. Sometimes you guys may be the one there who does that. So it's really valuable. Um, and I think another way that, that our patients aren't alone is that we carry them in a certain way. Um, I'm not thinking about them and praying them every moment of every waking minute by any means, but um, you know, they do, we do kind of carry them in our hearts and souls. We have these pagers and they go off at all kinds of, if you don't answer it, it buzzes and buzzes and buzzes and buzzes. And usually they aren't for me. They're, they're messages that somebody has died so-and-so has received his or her wings, that's our euphemism, but you've all gotten on the, the page, or it's, you know, somebody's having a birthday party and you all got to show up, or the number's been changed for the report line, or Dr. Brogan's going to the bathroom, you can't reach her for the next <laughs> five minutes, or, you know, I mean, it's things like that. Most of them are not for me. And so I was at lunch one day with my daughter, and it was in my purse, and it was just buzzing and buzzing, and I was ignoring it. And she says, Mom, People are dying in your purse. <laughs> and, and, and I thought, 
That's exactly right. I mean, you know, our purses is where we carry all of our stuff. Our credit cards, our keys, our Kleenex. I mean, all of the stuff that carries us, I don't know, some men have purses. I've had male friends who thought it was just better than beating up their hips by wearing fat wallets, you know. Um, and, and the stuff that we need that gets us through the day are in our purses. And our patients are in our purses, in kind of in the warp and woof of our lives, even if we aren't seeing them that particular day or that particular minute. And so there is, there is a real sense that, that while they're on service with us, we're carrying them. And, and so uh, they aren't alone in that way either. Um, when, uh, should I break or what's our, what's the time? Well, 2.30 is our break time. Oh, oh, keep going. Okay, what time is it? Oh, okay, cool, cool. Do you have any questions or comments at this point? I'm kind of at a major break in my uh, at, uh, Killing time with, with, uh, with the patient, whatever, uh, how much wine do we bring over? <laughs> <laughs> that was just a joke. That's my serious question. My serious question would be, um, <laughs> You answered some of the other questions that I wrote down. But, okay. Uh, the one was, uh, with if you're talking to the, to the patient, whatever, and they ask you, what do you think about life after death? Uh, and I know we're not supposed to really turn them in any direction or anything, just yeah. give suggestions or mm -hmm. whatever. I mean, what? Good, that's on one of my next items, but I'll do it right now. I think it would be good for each of you, uh, I don't know where you're all at on it, but to think through some of the questions people like might ask, like, so what do you think about the afterlife? It's entirely appropriate that you say, well, this is what I think. I've, I've read this, or somebody told me this, but you know, that doesn't make any sense. I don't like that idea anymore, or whatever. And um, um, I, that's entirely appropriate. And I, I think that's true with any other kind of question that might come up. Like, um, um, do you believe in God, or what's your faith, or I mean, any kind, any sort of question. Be honest about that. Right. And also, if you have it, if you, you know, are are someone who has not been involved in the church ever, or aren't at this time, just say that. Say, you know what, I'm I'm not there. I haven't even done anything about that. Should, should you then say, may I refer you to our um, chaplain? chaplain? You could. Sure, because it, it seems as though the chaplains are the ones, and that was something I noticed wasn't mentioned in this. They're the ones that are trained, and we we aren't specifically trained about no. the, the spiritual needs of somebody. Although no. you know we could read this, but that's not our forte. Mm -mm. No, it's not. And and thank you because I do like having the distinction. <laughs> but but um, it it um, but you do. You probably have done some thinking on on your own. I mean, I, I also wouldn't want to reinforce the notion that the only carriers of religion or spirituality in the culture are the ordained clergy. I mean, that that's not good either. When you know, and and that is true. But, I mean, but you I, always want us to be sincere, and if we feel that being sincere is not the best thing for the person at the time, then like what? Like I'm an atheist. <laughs> okay. And you know, and and I I don't know that people would. Uh, necessarily, you know, there are a lot. There's a lot of people who wouldn't even want me around if they knew that. And when they're going through something, although yeah. I, you know, I really don't have. Well, if you sense they're going to freak, if you say yeah. I'm an atheist, then then uh, you know, do some kind of clever. Well, I yeah, you know, and, and see, of. I mean, it, to me, it's it, it's you know, like it, it's first do no harm, <laughs> right? Yeah, and yeah. so I mean, that's where, yeah, that's where where. It's, come from yeah it's also they might say well why are you and and so but, but you know I, I mean this may not really be the time for a philosophical discussion about my beliefs uh, well but it, I, I would only be if they ask yeah no that yeah not, yeah but but at the, the same time you know it's uh, uh, well I, 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 um, number one yes you can refer to the chaplain and number yeah. two you can also talk about your own faith or non faith I mean whatever Whatever the well, uh, yeah. It, um, if you aren't comfortable, you don't need to do yeah, it. Yeah, right. So that's really how, how it. Yeah, works. you can absolutely I mean, say because I, I really, I'm, I'm think, not comfortable. I, you know, yeah, or just say, you know, I think I know what you need. You, you know, if you have a lot of questions, that's fine. Then why don't I get the chaplain here? You can, you can do that. And let me jump in here too, and just um, I, I'd like to underline something 
that you said. Um, and that is, as it relates to sort of the role of the volunteer, that it's really great to be reflective with your patients. And if asked once what your belief is, personally, I think the best answer is to reflect back to them. Well, you know, it's more important what your belief is. Why don't you tell me yours? I always try to give one a reflection. If pressed, then I, I go on. Do you know what I mean when I say that? Um, and this is one place where you and I yeah. might, might differ in terms of, of range or, or um, extreme or, or so forth. But um, on, in that notion of focusing on them, and finding that balance between self-disclosure and focusing on them. It really is a, a dance, and I encourage you all to be in your own dance with that in whatever way is appropriate. You know, you're in this program because we believe you're, you're safe at, at, at all speeds. So um, I trust that you have a certain level of discernment, um, respect for people's differences and diversity, and that you will be first compassionate. Do you know what I mean when I say that? You will, you said first do no harm. I would say first don't judge. First don't judge. Um, and then do no harm. And you won't harm if you don't judge. If you can, and this is in other areas besides spiritual care, if you can let go of your own agenda and walk with them. And sometimes that means let them walk first and you just be the Sherpa that carries their baggage and sort of points out flora and fauna along the way. But I would start with reflection first and a direct, sincere, honest answer second. And it's always fine to say, would you like our terrific spiritual, one of our terrific spiritual care staff to call on you? And that's always fair. So. Those are the, the kind, this kind of order of the steps I use. I, yeah, and I, I don't even know your personality. So whatever whatever fits best for you, go ahead and do. Um, my There's a line in, in 1 Peter that says, um, be prepared to give an account of the hope that is within you with all gentleness and meekness. And I think, um, you know, you can do that. Oh, well, no, I live yeah. by the golden rule. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and, and, and there's nothing that says that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I, go with your comfort level and, and what you're picking up from the patient and with the, the, the amount of, of um, uh, relationship that you've developed. Of course, you know, sometimes in one visit, it, it's right. quick and dirty and deep right away, and other people, three months, you still haven't made many inroads. So it, it, there's just, there's so many, um, um, vari variables in this sort of thing that go with your best instincts. I think it's it's so important to be real and honest in this business. Um, and and uh, if you if something tells you to hold back, then hold back. If something says now's the time to move in. Do it. Um, it's really an observation and uh -huh. using your empathetic. Yeah. It, yeah. It is. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, but but this business may uh, um, let's see invite you to reflect on some of these end of life issues if you haven't before, and maybe you've already done some of that or you wouldn't even be in this. I mean, you aren't afraid of doing it. Yeah, there is a really good section. Yeah, on reflecting. Yeah, and but just to you know even to speak to my training, um, I had a woman who was on service for less than a month. I probably saw her five times in that amount of time. Um, the first time, it was uh, just, well, the first day I got there, she had a horrible cancer, face bashed in, this eye closed, swollen, sewed up. She said, um, there's angels in this room, and that one's particularly beautiful. I said, oh, so, seeing angels, we're real near the end. Um, so am I going to die, she said. I said, well, what do you think? I think I am, she said. As what? the angel. Huh? <laughs> S. S. Yeah. Uh, the, the family was doing this funny little game about what the mom knew and who didn't know and who was in denial. And she, she factually didn't know, and the daughter did. But the mother was way more accepting than the daughter was. So it was this amazing sort of dance and denial and acceptance and all that. But anyway, the second time I got there, she said, so where am I going? I said, OK, let's talk about that. So I. Um, 
I never gave her an answer. I said, I don't know. The dead, they don't call, they don't write, they don't email. And I, that's absolutely true. What we have in the scriptures or any other religious material are pictures. And we don't even have that many pictures. Jesus even says things like the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. Well, you know, what are you going to do with that? Or it's like a woman who loses a coin. Um, so, I mean, it's just pictures. And, and they express hope. Um, and over a period of a couple of hours with her, I finally said, um, one pastor once said to me, he said, I don't think at all about what heaven's like or heaven or hell. He said, I believe if God has carried me up to this point in my life, I believe God will take care of me the other side of the grave. And it's just going to be a big surprise. <laughs> and she was okay with that. Well, she was for a while. The next visit, she had reopened it. But, you know, yeah. she hadn't been church in 50 years, so it's like it's all shut down. So we open it up, and we move this far. And then so we open really it up. she really know where she's going. Huh? <laughs> she really know where she's going. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I, I don't know. Do any of us know? I don't know. I believe the grace of God covers us all, period. And um, I, I couldn't hear any better answer. I mean, I could facilitate the discussion with a lot of um, probably commentary, and that's where my training it comes in, and also uh, being able to read things maybe a little better just because of the years of experience. But, um, you know, finally, I don't have an answer either. And if somebody says, I'm an agnostic, I'm saying, well, I think that's a really good place to be because, you know what, it's not about being sure. Hope is about, uh, is about hope and about promise, and that it's not about being sure. Faith is a very thin, Tradition, a very thin line uh, that, that's holding us. So, um, do I rest in that? Yeah, I rest in it, but I'm not going to marshal any proof support. So, um, anyway, I, I guess in this whole topic, the only thing that I don't want you to do is any kind of hard line, this is the way it's got to be. No proselytizing. No, absolutely none of that. But, but any. Any th or or trying to convince people that there isn't a God. I mean, one way or the other. That's probably. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. And we usually don't speak of it that way. Yeah. But yes, just um, it, to to engage the conversation. And and the thing is, is that even when you say I'm going to send the chaplain in, we may have one of the timid so sorts who all they can remember is a hellfire and brimstone preacher, and they want you. So just be aware of that. That they may want you. Um, so. Which doesn't mean we couldn't call and have a conversation or whatever, but you still might be the one to have that conversation with them. So, um, well, but I, I, but I, I think you know what JJ said is turn it back. Because yes, it's really, they're really inquiring about themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it is also true. Um, it, it, sometimes when people don't have, you know, the, I don't know if any of you have done any teaching. But I was doing a Bible class yesterday in Truckee, and these two chapters, and they just were sitting there. And my style is not to lecture, but to let them engage the text. And, and it later it occurred to me, maybe they didn't even know enough to ask the questions. I mean, it, it is true that you have to know a little bit about a topic to even begin to ask the questions. And you might have somebody who is just, you know, doesn't have any more information than what they've seen in, you know, cartoons or something, or, you know, Peter the gay jokes or whatever. You know, I mean, that's in our culture. And that's not a whole lot of substantive stuff, but that may be all they've got. So they may be just asking for a little bit of the prime to pump, too. So. Yeah, and it does and, and you, but even I how you read for them. That's right. And even how you ask the questions can can help prime the pump. You know, yeah. Is that? Yes. <laughs> okay. uh, you know, that, that's a big thing because. Uh, you know, in my business, kind of in sales, so mm -hmm. to speak, you know, I mean, right. part of the deal when you go see a customer or something, you're not really trying to do all the talking. You know, it's hard for me to be quiet a lot of times, but uh, but that's where you get a lot more out of the, you get more of a sale when you let the patient talk or the, or the, uh. the buyer talk, you know, mm -hmm. you let them hold the court. Oh, and, well, uh, I didn't know that. I just think it's like a number one rule of sales to listen first. You never know I'm, I'm getting a me. little parallel here with yeah with, yeah you with know. your own uh, yeah experience yeah yeah that's good that's a good analogy yeah. I, have a, I have a question um, yeah how much involvement do you have with the family through this process and after let's say after the death of their loved one well after the death it, it we don't do a whole lot there is a bereavement coordinator the other chaplain is what section 
She's in Portland. Oh, okay, okay. We, um, the other chaplain is halftime bereavement coordinator, and then there's another bereavement coordinator, I guess. I don't know quite how that all has worked out. We do have Tears and Rainbow support group, uh, which I'm one of the facilitators with, as is, is Father Carey. And we make, when we, um, every Wednesday we go through the deaths, we discuss the cases of who's, um, I don't need to do too much of this, I guess. Um, I, if it's been a patient that I've had contact with, I make at least one phone follow-up phone call. Sometimes there will be more, depending on what's going on. Sometimes I do the memorial service. Um, usually what I do bring up for them, if, if I got if the opportunity, and a lot of this stuff, I don't push stuff. This woman who didn't want the Greek Orthodox priest come until the very end, her daughter said to me, she said, I really appreciate your picking up on the family vibes and not insisting on coming for a visit when mom didn't want that. And I said, well, I try never to do that. And, and, and I, I even um, cringe sometimes. We have to do plan of cares for, for the patients. And I really resist having to have a goal for someone else in their life. It, I, it just really rankles me. I mean, I use the same old ones, like have an increasing sense of peace. Well, hell, I want that for the whole world, you know? <laughs> or, you know, provide pastoral care. Well, yes, I'd like to sit there, you know? But um, we don't have enough. And sometimes it feels like slam, bam, thank you, ma'am. You know, they're, on, they're off and we're on to the next one. But that's just the way it is, you know? Um, we're all part-time, nobody's full-time, and you just cannot keep up with the current needs and still do a lot of, uh, of uh, bereavement stuff. Occasionally I make bereavement visits, but that doesn't happen very often. So Catherine Wade, who's yeah. the other person that was talking about, will be in to speak with you yeah. this afternoon. Oh, cool. Yeah. So yeah. she'll yeah. go into that in greater yeah. detail. Yeah. But th there is some some and I almost wish we could do a little more time wise because I imagine that process will really affect some people's faith systems and challenge their beliefs whether and vice they have a family <coughs> going through that or you know obviously the person going or through it as yeah. well yeah you also asked the, the how much contact with the family it it varies from uh, case to case you know sometimes there's nothing with the patient I mean especially if you come in and the patient's already non-responsive I'll do some of the coaching and stuff but a lot of it is hanging, that woman who said, this is the chaplain, she's just hanging out with us. I was petting the dog who was going nuts. I was talking to his daughter from Seattle. I was comforting his brother who was there, his mother-in-law, the friend. I mean, I was, I was working the whole crowd, you know. And um, I, I have another woman I made a, a, an appointment with the patient. And they, they were all okay, and then finally he got really nervous, and she called to cancel the appointment. And I never got the message for some reason, but she said, "Well, I'm glad you've come anyway." So we stood out in the porch, and she talked to me for 20 minutes. She said, "I really needed." I said, "Okay." So, and and I want he has a Catholic priest coming to see him, so it's fine. If he ever calls me in, fine. But you know, in this case, it's it's maybe the caregiver. Sometimes they never want to visit, and I end up always talking to the the primary caregiver. You know, and you're just encouraging and supporting, and um, in that case, a lot, of, some of that stuff, uh, I, I do. Again, you're absolutely loved, forgiven, and not alone. I say that to everybody, but but also some of our best caregivers are um, real nervous about over medicating. You know, and so I I tell them that you know this end of the life of the at this end you can't do anything wrong. I mean, if you're delivering a baby in a elevator, you could get the cord wrapped wrong, right and about there are long-term consequences. We aren't, yeah, you aren't, you aren't, you probably don't have enough in that house medicine to kill mom. Um, you, you aren't, they, they're trying to find the line between I don't want her to suffer and I don't want her to doped up. And, and that changes, and as the disease progresses, we're always monkey. Every Wednesday, we have up on the screen, whenever the technology is working, everybody's med list, and we're running through and what needs to be adjusted. I mean, that is a big part of what we do in IDT. And, um, and I tell them, you know, it, when most of them have had kids. I said, you know, when your kids are little and they're sick, you maybe didn't know what to do, so you called your doctor, you called your mom, you called your best friend, you did your research, now you go on the internet. And then you took your best shot. And the best tool that you had in your toolkit is that you love this kid, you know, and you got him through. And the best tool you got in your toolkit is that you love your mom or your husband or whatever. And that, that is something that you have over any of the rest of the hospice team. You love this person. You've got history with them. And um, 
just trust yourself. They often need to hear that. And so, you know, you might be in that position too of just encouraging the caregiver to, you know, hang in there and we're thinking of you and it gets long. They, uh, like I said before, they have, um, they may have family members or friends who, you know, well, my mother said the same thing when my dad goes on hospice. She said, well, I didn't approve of it. Everybody who goes on hospice ends up dead. <laughs> By definition, <laughs> mom. <laughs> And my family, I must say, gave that hospice nurse a run for her money. They were not nice to her. I wrote her a note afterwards, thanking her and apologizing for my family's behavior. This is 11 years ago, and I didn't know anything about hospice, but they were not nice. Anyway. Um, Everybody that doesn't go on hospice ends up there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know. I know. But that's what, you know, that's our culture. That's our culture, you know. You know, and the jokes that people say to me is, like, oh, you do that, do you? Oh, well, uh, how come you aren't depressed or, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But, well, anyhow, other questions or comments or at this point, juncture. Okay, I'll, I'll plow on here. Um, let's see, I've done a couple of these here. Um, some people do say to me, you know, oh, you must be getting depressed. And I say, no, I'm not. Um, and I think a couple of reasons. Number one is that it's really an honor to be with people at this time. It is so intimate, and they let us into their lives. I mean, I am amazed again and again. I walk into the room and, oh, Ruth, you're here, to an absolute stranger, because I got this badge on, you know, and I phoned. Um, I mean, the, the, the level of trust in this institution, both in St. Mary's and the medical field and, and this whole enterprise of hospice, is incredible. I mean, they really trust us. They're, they're in desperate straits often, even even when Grandpa's 95 and they they wanted to go because it's been so long, you know, that he suffered. Um, but I I am just amazed at at the way they honor us. I mean, some of them don't want us to come at all. We got we had one woman died recently, and on the report line it says the husband wants no chaplain to call. A nurse can call, but no chaplain. <laughs> Thought she wasn't my patient, okay, fine. <laughs> but you know, there are people like that. But by and large, they let us in, and I, I just, I just, again and again, I'm thrilled with that. The other thing is that um, I'm a Christian, and East, we're Easter people. You know, we do Lent and and Easter, and we keep but baptism about about a dying and rising to new life, and a lot of the other religious traditions also have <coughs> metaphors of death and resurrection. And, and I, I live in hope, and so um, I don't, it is not um, always a just horrible, you know, depressive place. It doesn't mean that I'm not sad, um, and I, I can enter into to crying with the people. Um, but, but the other thing is that I, too, don't have the history that they have. I mean, this is mom who's dying after whom they've known all their lives, or it's a spouse of 61 years or whatever. When you've got that much history, the grief is very different from the hospice chaplain who has maybe entered in very profoundly at, at this point, by that, that I mean deeply, but doesn't have the longevity. And, and it just, it, the, the grief experience is just not the same for us. It, it simply isn't. And that's how I <coughs> keep doing this. You know, you enter into it, but, uh, but it's, you know, you live in hope and, and also it's not, uh, we don't have that. that depth.